If you want to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, we'll be looking at verse 4 through 7 this afternoon. I did want, before I begin this message, to commend those of you who are, who are here today. I'm thankful for the atmosphere that is here. Amen. Those of you who are coming uh, from the preacher's desk as well as those from the pew know the value of a good atmosphere. Environment is everything. That's why we've been seated in heavenly places. Environment is very critical. And coming from hindering influences and hindering environments, places that are like Capernaum, to go into places like Samaria where people are receiving the word. You are the ones who have created the environment here. It's an environment of faith. It's an environment of the unity of that faith and the unity of the spirit. And for that, I am very grateful. Thank you for that. I also thank you for the music. Be Thou My Vision is one of my, one of my favorite songs. It's good to hear good truths spoken and sung with good harmony. And uh, so I want to thank you for that music. Music has been a source of edification for me uh, for a very long time. And uh, so I want to thank you for those beautiful, beautiful voices today. We're going to be looking at this text in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 7 in which we find the words written, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, there are a lot of things that are here. There are some overriding themes, general things about salvation. These things are very well apparent to all of us, but it's good to remind us of these things, particularly in the day in which we live. So let me take just a moment to mention some of them. One thing you want to see about salvation that's in here is that it's a work that transforms those being saved. I'll never forget, I think it was two renewals ago, I think it was Brother Tim that actually said this. He said, I'm not interested in a salvation that doesn't change me. Amen. And I'm not either. Amen. A salvation, a person that is saved is a person that is changed. Amen. You may recall when Jeremiah went down to the house of the potter, and the potter had upon his will a work that had marred in his hands, and he began to reshape and remold the very work that was marred in his hands. And the Lord said unto him, <coughs> O house of Israel, cannot I do this with you as the potter? Say the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Salvation is the great potter from heaven remaking and remolding corrupted humanity. Because he tells us in our text, we were dead. But we've been made alive again. Salvation is a spiritual working that yields eternal benefits. We do have to say that in a day in which we find there are certain movements amongst us that emphasize physical promises. Things that God has supposedly said he would give us. But you can imagine if God's promises were locked, stock, barrel in the physical world, how you'd have to give those things up. Because the earth's going to burn up. Well, salvation is a spiritual work. Our text tells us that he seated us in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. In fact, if this was a physical promise, the text would fall flat to the ground. For once, we aren't really dead physically. That hasn't happened. We haven't been made alive physically because we were born. That hasn't happened. Imagine the blessing, being blessed in the earthly places, things you'd have to give up. See, the text wouldn't mean anything if it wasn't spiritual. See, but it is spiritual. I like what Paul said. He said, we don't look to the things which are seen. We look to the things which are not seen. And then he reasons. But the things which are seen are temporary. And the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. A little bit of heavenly logic there. Salvation is a mutually benefiting work. Amen. Paul had not started the church was at, that was at Rome, but he anticipated coming to that church. And he told them, in the very first chapter of his letter to them, in the 11th verse, he said, I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. 
<coughs> to the end that you may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. See, in salvation, what God's doing, he's forming a people for himself. That's what he wants. We're his inheritance. And while he's doing that, he's given us an inheritance. See, it's a mutually benefiting, mutually benefiting salvation. And one more thing, salvation is a work that is displaying the person of God. That's the point of salvation. God is said to be a God of peace. He's said to be a God of love. He's said to be a God of all comfort and a God of all grace and a God of glory and a God of hope. And all these things are being displayed in salvation. How about Romans 16? What a precious promise. The God of peace shall bruise Satan underneath your feet shortly. It's going to happen soon. It's a work of salvation, but it's showing us about a God who's one day going to get rid of the one who's, in it, who's agitating us so much. He's going to get rid of him. The enemy is going to be done away. Or how about the, the God of hope make you to abound? Abound in hope. He said it's through believing. He might fill you with all joy and peace that you might abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, this is telling you things about God. He wants us to anticipate what he has for us as much as he is. And he's a God that has prepared a future for us. Amen. Salvation is showing that. A God of love. Finally, brethren, farewell, be patient, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. God loves you too much to leave you alone for a moment of time. His tender cares upon you because he is a God of love. See, salvation is showing us a lot about God. That's what it's doing. Now, there are a number of affirmations in our text that I want to tell you right now before we get into this. So you know in the midst of my message, this is what I'm getting across. <laughs> and here it is. Look, look at these things that are revealed about God. God is rich in mercy. He is. God is great in love. He is. God is a life-giving spirit. He's made us alive. God is exceedingly rich in grace. He is that. And God is kind. He is. Don't forget that he doesn't know what it's like to be weak. But he is good to us in our times of weakness. Thank God for a God that is kind. Now, he's not just telling us what he is. He's doing it too. And look what our text says. Here's the proof of his love toward us. He made us alive when we were dead. That's something he did. He raised us up. Something he did. He made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Well, that's good. Don't forget, he's going to make some people sit in places that aren't so good. He's made us sit in heavenly places. Amen. And of him are we in Christ. I mean, we've been made, made in Christ. Brought into him. And the display of God's rich grace and kindness toward us is through Christ forever. <laughs> These are things he's doing. Things he's done, things he's doing, things he will do. God's love is surrounding us, so to speak. Now, don't forget in the midst of this, the reason for our position right now and what it shall be in relation to God, it is Christ, bottom line. We have been raised up with Christ, he tells us. We have been seated in heavenly places in Christ. The count's for getting those good resources you get like grace and peace and mercy. And the display of God's rich grace and kindness toward us in those ages to come will be because of Jesus. Amen. It'll be because of him. Well, these are the things I want you to know. I'm reminded of the word that Paul gave to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, 4-7. He said, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. That in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Well, that's what our text is telling us today. So I want to draw some of these things out, show them to you. There are kind of five what I call measuring points 
to the richness of God's mercy and to the greatness of his love that I want to be able to bring across today. When I say measuring point, I'm back in the cabinet business work. In the cabinet business, we measure points with tape measures, one point to another, to get an idea of the, of the greatness of something. Now, the bigger something is, the further the two points are from one another, right? Well, there's something about God's mercy and God's love that's being made known here. He tells us we were dead, way over here. But he's made us alive, way over here. Huh? I'm going to tell you today that we once were enemies. But now we're the sons of God. I mean, how great a love is that? Amen. Once we were in darkness and now we're in light, those things are presumed in being alive again. Amen. Once we were dwelling down here in this earthly realm, in the slew, and now we're up here in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. You see, the vastness and the greatness of God's love is seen by the measurement of distinct points which are being made known in our text. And I want to show you some of those right now. His love and mercy can be seen from the depth from which he retrieved us. Amen. That's true. The psalmist said it this way. In Psalm 103, 2 and 5. Bless the Lord God, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all of our iniquities. Who heals all our diseases. Who redeems thy life from the pit. Who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. We're going to see that today. His love and mercy is comprehended in what was required to make us alive. Amen. You see, don't forget that between life and death is that old rugged cross. It required a lot. It required a lot of mercy. It required a lot of love for God to save us. Don't ever let those familiar texts of Scripture become too familiar to you that you overlook them. Because there is a profound confession when God tells the world, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. There's a lot to that. We'll look at that some today. His love and mercy are measured by what great change He has worked in us. He's made us alive. Paul declared in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. You see, I'm not interested in just external changes or procedures or routines. I need change within. The text is telling us we've been made alive. That's a big change from where we were. His love and mercy are seen in the position to which he has elevated us. He didn't elevate us back to the earth, brother, and he brought us into heavenly places. Amen. That's where he brought us. Heavenly places. And by the way, that's where Jesus is, so you know it's pretty high. Amen. Heavenly places. I like the psalmist here. Oh, these are good words. Isn't it good the Bible just sounds good? I mean, these words, they just sound good. Well, here's a good sound right here. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Well, we can all relate to the dunghill, can't we? We can all relate to being beggars. God help us to relate to being princes because that's what you are. Amen. The princes of his people. I mean, you've been set up in places where Abraham's at. You've been set up in places where the Apostle Paul's at and where Peter is at and all these godly people through the centuries are. We're up there in faith. Pretty soon we'll be up there in, in person. So we've been raised up. And his love and mercy are broadened in the eternal scope of this great work Amen. and the quality of life that will extend into the ages to come. That's marvelous. It's marvelous. I like the psalmist again on this. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Well, I know there's a lot to cover here. So I just encourage you to put on your spiritual seatbelts and we're going to take a ride. There are a lot of good things to be seen here. So I encourage you, when we're on this Mount Zion, when we're, looking, when we're kind of walking around on here, just, just kind of take a look around. There's a lot of good things to be seen that are in this text. Now, 
Let's affirm first. He, the, the Spirit, I like the way He speaks. He doesn't waste any words. The word even means a whole lot. Yes. Even. Even. When we were dead in trespasses and sins. Even then. I like how Ezekiel puts it in Ezekiel 16, 1-6. God reminds His people of where they were when He obtained them. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, Thus saith the Lord God on Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother was a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to, su to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thy own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Amen. Yea, and I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Amen. There is profitability, brethren, in considering where we've come from. You see, there is a great depth to God's love that can be plumbed as we look back to where He brought us from. Give me a moment just to tell you what it means to be dead in sins, some of what's involved in that. For example, before Jesus retrieved us, we walked according to the course of this world, Ephesians 2.2 2 says. They said, well, what does that mean, to live according to the course of this world? Well, it means to have our attention on the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The things that filled our hearts were things we could see. They were things that we could touch. They were things we could smell, things we could look upon. Those were the things that drove us at that time. It was the pride of life. It was building a life without God. It was finding satisfaction from things on the earth that didn't have anything to do with God. There are people doing this today. Well, we were part of that at one time. We let our flesh run free. This is amazing that we ever did this. Finding ourselves delighting in things that God has cursed. You see, we walk according to the course of this world. We had our hope in the things of this life. Thank God for deliverance from this. Amen. We were living a life of destruction, the Bible tells us. Titus 3 3 declares, we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. There was a time, brethren, when the very same nature that is now at work in men who would dare to come against God's, God's image in another man and take his head off with a camera on him. There was a time in which we imbibed the nature that did that. You see, a lot of these things we may not ever have done, but we did imbib the nature that did. <laughs> oh, the only reason we didn't fall further than we did is because the grace of God was on us. Amen. And by some means, his forbearance was on us to keep us from going further down. I think it was Martin Luther himself who was shocked when he came to realize that there was no bottom to which a man could fall in depravity and iniquity. Well, we're seeing some of that today. We were hateful. We were living a life of destruction. Think of what we're doing today. What are we doing here? What's the point of the assembly of the saints? To edify, to build up, to encourage, to strengthen, to lift up, to comfort. That's not what we were doing. Well, we've come a long way just to be doing that, haven't we? <laughs> Isn't it good just to be in a service where you can be lifted up? Boy, it's good not to have to overcome the service when you're walking out the doors. Isn't that good? I'm glad we're here. I'm glad we're here. We were dead, see. We were serving fleshly lusts. Ephesians 2, 3 tells us. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 speaks about a deplorable category of people. At one time, we were part of this. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Some of us were. 
There are those of us who now have our feet planted on heavenly soil, but at one time were thieves. That's true. There was a time when some of us were robbing people. There was a time like that. See, there was a time like that. Well, thank God for being made alive. I'm showing you, we were dead. We were dead. We were living under an umbrella of darkness, like a great eclipse that was over us at that time. You see, the Bible says that we've been delivered from the power of darkness. That means there's one time we were under it. Orchestrated by the God of this world who is now blinding the minds of them that believe not. You want to see this power at work? You go out there and talk to someone and have them ignore what you're saying. Why is that? Because there's a God in this world who is setting himself up to be another God. And he's using the world to draw men into it. The world is like a great whirlpool is what it is. It's got a vortex and it's drawing men into the middle of it where this God dwells. And in doing that, it's blinding men to a greater thing that God has for them. Well, there was a time we were in that category. There was a time. There was a time when we were doing, this is a big one. There was a time, brethren, when we were doing the will of the devil. The Bible talks about those right now who are taken captive by him at his will. Well, so much for free will. There are two wills going on in this world. There are two wills who are being realized. There's the will of God and there's the will of the devil. Those are the two wills and everybody falls into one of those camps and you can't be in both at the same time. There was a time in which the devil put a harness in our mouth and stepped on our back and rode us all the way. That's happened. He was. We did what he wanted. We just, that's what happened. We thought we were doing what we wanted, but the end was what he wanted. Death in trespasses and sins. You see the depth from which he has taken us. Amen. And I'll tell you, I'm thankful for this great salvation. That is exactly what it is. Amen. Now, here's what I want you to see. What we did was a commentary of what we were. Yes. All right? We sinned because we were sinners. We did evil because we were evil. All right? We were evil. That's why we did what we did. I'll tell you this. This makes our condition that much more serious. <laughs> See, it wasn't just an outward corruption. It wasn't just some kind of a behavioral flaw. That's not what this was. Amen. It's bigger than that. Yes. It's not a defiling influence from the outside. It's from the inside. We were dead. Amen. And sins was simply the evidence of that death. Amen. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus said it this way. In Matthew 12, he said, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. We were corrupt. Amen. We were a bad tree, you might say. I like this text in Romans chapter 3, as you know, verse 13 through 16. Here we have a delineation, kind of a spiritual biopsy, I call it, of corrupted humanity. It's like a collage of texts from the Psalms and pulled together to show us what corrupted humanity is. Now what I want you to see here, I want you to see the progression of the text. All right, because I just saw this and I think there's something really here to be seen. <laughs> now notice, I want to read it to you. Here it is. Their throat is an open sepulcher. That's from within. All right, follow the progression here. With their tongues, they have used deceit. Here we are up here. The poison of asp is under their lips. So here we're coming out. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. You see, it was death within. It hit the mouth, it hit the hands, it hit the feet, but it was there because it was in here. We were a dead race. That's my point. We were a dead race. Now, this final thing before we move on. The biggest thing that we were dead to, brethren, was the God from which we fell. Amen. Think of what our relationship was to God at that time. All right, I'll just give you a few scriptures. We'd really have to move on and hasten here. The Bible says that we were without hope and without God in the world. There was a time like that. Imagine that being without God in this world and without hope. <laughs> nothing that you could think about that was eternal. Certainly nothing like this. You know, the world says things like, well, you know, you only go around once. See, that's without hope. There was a time like that. We were alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that it was in us because our hearts were darkened. 
There was a time like that. We had no idea what God was doing at that time. We just didn't know. Alienated through ignorance. Well, I'll tell you, this is a motivation to let the Word of God dwell in you richly. You have fellowship with God to the degree that you understand Him. That's the truth. Ignorance brought alienation. Alienated from the life of God. Isn't that something? From the life of God. And we were enemies. Just let the ramifications of being in transgressions and sin register on your heart. We are dealing with a God of righteousness and justice. The Bible tells us that we were children of wrath by nature. It isn't so much what people do that offends God as much as it is as what makes them do what they do. It's the nature that's within them. That is what's so offensive to God. The fact they wanted to do it, that's what's so offensive to God. Well, Amos told us, can two, can two walk together except they be agreed? I'll tell you, we were way off from being agreed with God. And a God of righteousness has to, at some point, deal with unrighteousness. Amen. The great day of judgment is going to show that. God has got to deal with iniquity. And it was in us at that time. Well, it was a pretty deep pit he brought us from, isn't it? Amen. Pretty deep pit. Well, you can see the greatness of his mercy just in that. I'll tell you. We have come a long way. But the greatness of his mercy and of his love is also seen in what required and what was required to make us alive. Now, that's not in this text, but it's presumed. Think of this, first of all, of 4,500 years of forbearance. Now, you think of the potential of a God who has all power. In Psalm 2, the Bible tells the kings of this world to kiss the Son. Do you remember why? Lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Huh? But a little. Isn't that something? We've got a God of absolute control on our hands. Look what he could do if he wanted to. Well, you can thank God that I wasn't God at that time. You, at that time, I have at times flared up a little bit. If God were to flare up a little bit, the world wouldn't be here anymore. All right? Understand, this time of forbearance, you don't doubt in your heart at all that God was touched by what he saw on the earth. Think right from the beginning, God could have wiped away the human race right there, Adam and Eve going against his wishes and eating of that fruit. You think that didn't touch God's heart? He moved, he walked through the cool of the garden that day that his heart wasn't touched by a human race that, that recalcitrated from God, that came back from him, was uncomfortable in his presence. Oh yeah, it touched his heart. Yes. He could have at that moment gotten rid of it. Think of when the first man showed the capacity of sin and raising up his hand against his own blood and killed him. God could have gotten rid of the human race at that point. But forbearance kept running on the divine timeline. Huh? Think about the time when evil filled the earth. Violence filling the earth. And the thoughts and the inclinations of men's hearts was evil continually. Now God could have just got rid of everybody. Don't think Noah was perfect. I understand his faith sanctified him, but he wasn't perfect. There was forbearance to bring him into the ark. There was. Well, I'll tell you, you move forward in the days of the nation of Israel, the great tempter of the living God, at least at that point. Aren't you looking forward to them coming back again? I can't wait to see them come back again. Nonetheless, think of the time they were in the wilderness. They'd just been delivered, just come to the Red Sea, and not a, not a, just a little over a month later, they're giving credit to somebody else for that great deliverance. And murmuring and griping in the wilderness coming upon the land of Canaan that God had promised to them and shrinking back from it. We're not able. We're grasshoppers in their sight. God could have just wiped the race out at that point. Wiped everybody else out. We'll say, what about the Gentiles? Well, they were trading the glory of God into image made like into corruptible things like beasts. That's what they were doing at that time. But the forbearance of God kept running down the divine timeline. Think of the days of Jesus when Pharisees in the name of God 
were exploiting people and laying on them burdens that they couldn't handle, misrepresenting the name of God, not talking about God's mercy. God could have been done with it right there. And think of that great cross of Calvary when they thought he was smitten and afflicted and shouted spurgeons to him from the ground and mercilessly beat him and put him on the cross. At that point, no doubt, God could have done this. Don't forget, Jesus did say, forgive them. Oh, he knew of the righteous indignation. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, I'll tell you, that was a long period of forbearance. And you know what that's called, scriptures? Times of ignorance. God winked at it. Why? Because he's rich in mercy. That's why. Amen. He's rich in mercy. That's why, well, finally, a man did come. As the Bible says, truth sprang up from the earth and righteousness looked down. Huh? Finally, a man came along. God called him his servant. He said, he's the one in whom is all my delight. <laughs> Look at where you find Jesus. So, oh, 12 years old. What's Jesus doing? Well, he's not tromping on the Nintendo. That's not what he's doing. <laughs> they go to Jerusalem and Jesus finds the temple. Hmm? That's what Jesus was doing. Remember, his mother had a chide for him because he was left, no doubt, enthralled in the things of God. <laughs> and asking questions and giving some pretty solid answers for, for that age, no doubt. Shocking the doctors of that time. And his mother chided him. He said, did you not know? This was a 12-year-old. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Amen. Now, what do you think that did to the father's heart? What would it do to yours? What would it do to yours? Think about that. Oh, well, here's what the Spirit said about that time period. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Isn't that something? You know, it dawned on me when I was considering that text. Here we are doing the very same thing. And me thinks, if I put my ear to the heavenly floor, I can hear the rumbling and stretching of the heart of God for the love of His people who have chosen to come here during this time in order to ask questions and give answers. Yes. Isn't that good? Amen. That's our God. Well, this is His Son. No doubt after 30 years... God tells us what he thinks of his son. 30 years of his son's life, finally heaven speaks forth after 400 years of silence and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Amen. That's something. Amen. That is something. I've lived 31 years and that could not be said of me apart from Christ. But Jesus earned it. Amen. He was the son of God's love. That's what he was. Think of the time in which Jesus was in Samaria in the midst of a heated revival and he'd forgot to go get McDonald's. His disciples come back unto him, say, Master, you need to eat. And he said, you don't know. I've got food you don't know about. Yeah. And he said these words, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. This is what drives me. It is not my stomach that drives me. It is my heart toward God that drives me. Doing His will is what brings me the greatest degree of satisfaction. Amen. And I want to get it done. Amen. This is the Son I'm telling you about. This is the Son of His love. It's marvelous. And if that wasn't enough, here we gather ourselves around the Last Supper that Jesus already knew <laughs> this was the time. He spends some time with his disciples telling them what he must do. He gives them some examples, some instructions. And then he goes in to a garden and agonizes in prayer before the living God. Here the righteous one is about to take on sin. And he says, not my will, but thine be done. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's the one that Romans 8.32 says that he did not spare. He did not spare his son, but he delivered him up for who? For us all. For us all. That is what he did for us. And then the, I love the divine reason. He goes on to say, well, if he didn't spare his son, I mean, what, what do you think he would withhold from us? Oh, he's going to he'll freely give us all because when he gave his son, he gave you his heart. That's what the father did. He gave you the best he had, the thing he loved the most. 
that servant in whom was all his delight. I'll tell you, I'm showing you the depth of his love and the greatness of his mercy. <laughs> he didn't save us by looking at us. He saved us by looking at his son. This is a remarkable thing to see. I'm sure you can see these things. It's, uh, it reminds me of uh, that great song that's found in 226. It's a familiar song to all of us, but just listen to these lyrics. They're so marvelous. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I gladly take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. A home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Upon that cross of Jesus, my eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess the wonders of his glorious love and my unworthiness. Well, the cross stood between death and life. The cross stood between darkness and light. The cross stood between enemies and sonship. The cross is everything to us. Well, we have to move on, though. It would be good to stay on that. There's a lot of good things that are there. Now, look, at the text says that he's made us alive. He's actually done this. He's made us alive with Christ and seated us in heavenly places. How would God change the course of such a corrupt creature? How would he do it? Would it be with a list of rules? Well, we've already seen that. That didn't work. Would it be with a five-step plan? Would it be that? Would it be just going through some steps? Somebody with some good ideas of how to, be, how to have a successful Christian life? Is that what it's about? Or is it just about reasoning with people? About, about how corrupt and bad sin is? Is that, is that what this is? No, the solution ran deeper than that. God resolved all the troubles of every one of us by joining us to his son. Amen. That's what he did. That's how he made us alive together with him. Well, I'll tell you, this is remarkable. There's a principle of life in Christ Jesus that I just want to develop here for just a second, and we'll move on. Is everybody doing okay? Huh? Everybody all right? If you're having a hard time, go ahead and stand up. We don't want you to miss these great truths. There's a lot here, okay? There's a lot to be seen. There's a principle of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 2 talks about so the Bible calls it the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right? There are two principles that operate in the world. When I say principle, I don't mean like a, like a moral code you can break, but like gravity. It's like a principle you can't break. That actually drive a person. All right? The direction in which a person lives will be based on what principle they're under here. Amen. There's the principle of sin and death, which we've just been talking about. And there's the principle of life. That's in Christ Jesus. All right? It's a principle that leads up into heavenly places. All right? It's that kind of a principle. Now, how does this principle work? Well, it reminds me of the days. I believe it was, it was the Moabites that were going through the land of Israel. There was conflict that was taking place there. You may recall the Israel, some Israelites were going to bury a man. Am I got it right? Well, some Israelites were going to bury a man. And uh, they saw some men coming through, so they just threw them in the hole real quick. Well, it happened to be Elisha's grave. Wow, what a coincidence. As soon as that man touched those bones, he came to life. Now here's what this text is telling us. This is how God was going to raise up dead men. He's got to get you in contact with his son. Amen. That is the answer to sin and death. Amen. That's the answer. Amen. Just touching the son. That's the answer. Amen. I'll tell you, a woman who had an issue of blood could tell you what this is all about. Amen. If, you could just, if we could just get people to Jesus, they'll come to life. <laughs> they'll come if they just the point you contact with the son of glory you come to life because Jesus says I am life Amen. John wrote this uh, no doubt through the spirit with, with, with the spirit of this principle in mind and he said this he that hath the son hath a life he did. you have the son you have life All right. did you understand also that this is the answer to overcoming iniquity all right, this is not simplifying things. Believe me, this is not oversimplifying the truth. The answer to overcoming iniquity is closeness to Christ. That's what it is. He said, abide in me. He said, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Well, I'll tell you. You preachers, you tell that to your people. Make sure they know this. Jesus will not fail you. God is faithful by whom you are called in the fellowship of his son. He's faithful. You will not come short in Jesus. Of this great salvation. You'll not. See, he, he is life. 
He doesn't just impart life, He is life. And we've been connected to Him and that has made us alive. Now what does it mean to be made alive? We have to move on. What does it mean to be made alive? Well here, because you're believers and you are alive, I'm going to give you some confirmation that you are alive. All right, But this is part of being made alive. One thing, you're spiritually minded. That's part of being made alive. Amen. The Bible says that they that are spiritually minded set their minds on the things of the Spirit. That's what they do. Drops down a few verses and says that that, that is life. <laughs> to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It is. Amen. See, It not only promotes life, it's the evidence that you have the life. If you can drive the earth out and just have your mind absorbed in spiritual things, sometimes losing track of time, sometimes losing track of meals, if you can push the earth out and think on heavenly things, that's an evidence that you're alive. Amen. You can't do that unless you're alive. See, that's part of being alive. Amen. And you see the practicality of this. God doesn't just want us alive. He wants us with Him. <laughs> and He's spiritual, and the things that He surrounds Himself with are spiritual. And we're learning right now to just, just bask and live in the presence of spiritual things. That's all we're going to be doing there. Amen. Another confirmation of life is a sincere love of the brethren. Amen. I mean, this is how we know we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's how we know. See, it's part of being alive. Isn't it good just to have a sincere love for God's people? If your heart moves for people that are of God... That's what the brethren are. These are people that are begotten of God. We already heard that in 1 John 5. These are people that are begotten of God. That's who the brethren are. If you are attracted to people that are godly, you're alive. You're, you're in this principle where the spirit of life operates. I'll tell you, this is wonderful. How about this? You're discontent with life in the body. I told the brethren this on Sunday when I preached to them. We talked about the glory to come, some of the things that are involved in that. As long as you are in this life, you will find yourself constantly disappointed with your efforts and labors. Now, I'm not, I'm not promoting iniquity, so don't get me wrong here. I'm not encouraging people that are, in, that are adulterers and things like this. This isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a sincere labor for God. But you've got ambitions that are in that new nature that are wrought for the world to come. Yes. All right? And you don't have a body that's right now capable of doing everything you would like it to do. But one day you will. If you're groaning today, we have any groaners in here? Amen. It's an evidence of life. That's the new man's language as long as he's in the world. Groan. Well, there are more things that we could say. I'll give you just one more and we'll move on. A lively hope. Peter tells us that we've been begotten unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, an anticipation of glory required power from God. That wasn't... <laughs> We aren't pumping one another up. That's not what anticipation is. It's based on an understanding that the Son of God has given us. If your heart moves with gladness when you consider the glories of the time to come when Christ is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, it's a time when we be clothed with immortality. It's that kind of a time. It's a time when we're going to be like Him because we'll see Him as He is. Your heart moves toward that. That's a lively hope. A lively hope is a hope that's alive. That's very simple. Living people move. A hope that is lively moves within the individual. Huh? And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, Amen. even as he is pure. Well, that's a little bit in what's involved in our life, but we have to move on. Now, we haven't just been made alive. We've been seated in heavenly places. All right? We've been seated up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Alright? Well, you say, well, what does that mean? You know, the, in Ephesians, there's more talk about heavenly places. That phrase is, is more concentrated in Ephesians than any other epistles that Paul writes about. You read about heavenly places in the first chapter. You read about it in the second chapter. You read about it in chapter 6. There it is, heavenly places. Well, I'm just going to give you this angle so you can get a hold of this. I know there are a lot of preachers that don't even talk about this. About heavenly places. But that's where we've been raised up. It's like being a partaker of the first fruits of the land of Canaan. That's what this is like. You see, being seated in the heavenly place is more than just position. It's privilege. All right? Do you know what I mean when I say that? It's about the things that we obtain now that we're there that you could not obtain unless you were there. Do you understand that? Do you follow me here? It, it, it was like that. When, remember when they came? Here they come. 
through the wilderness. They're at the, the, just on the edge of the land of Canaan. They send spies to the land. And they bring back the fruit of the land. Boy, what that must have been like. <laughs> a taste of those grapes. And a taste of the different fruits of that land. Well, that's what we're doing now. It's what the Bible calls the powers of the world to come. There are things that you have a right to now that you are in heavenly places that you could not obtain unless you were there. All right, let me give you some examples. The Bible tells us that we have a throne of grace. Throne of grace. All right, this is found in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and verse 16. He encourages us to draw near. <laughs> he doesn't say, I'll bring the throne down to you. No, he said, you come up to it. Huh? There is a throne in heaven where grace is dispensed and where you can find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Now, here's how I reason. If you have obtained mercy and grace, it isn't just that mercy and grace came down. It's that you were up in high places. You obtained it from the throne. All right? It's, it's the, I'm showing you the privileges of being seated in the heavenly places. This is the angle I chose to show this because this is a great truth to see. You have so many blessings to be realized. Notice how the apostle opened this great letter. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. Some of those different blessings. You've been blessed with a treasure of truth. It says all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are, are hidden in Christ. That's where they're at. You've come to the knowledge of these things. You're growing more in, in the grace of God and the knowledge of the Son. That's because you're up here in these heavenly places. You see, being in Christ, it's more than just a fellowship. Oh, that's wonderful, so don't make... I mean, that sounds bad to even say that. because I don't mean it bad. But that fellowship is what transports you up into like a big, large room. David talked about a large room. I mean, that's what this is like. Your fellowship brings you into this large room. Think of all the great things you've received from Jesus when you were in fellowship with Him. Yeah. Thinking upon His name. Well, He does set a good table when you come and listen. Yeah. He does. And you obtain new things. That's because you're in heavenly places. The fellowship of justified spirits who have been now made perfect is part of being seated in heavenly places. The Bible tells us that we've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And he tells you about a number of personalities that are up there that affect us. That's what, it, that's what he means when he says we've come. <laughs> Is that these, these personalities up here are actually affecting us by some means. He mentions the angels, an innumerable company of angels that is said in Hebrews 1 to be, our minutes, to be ministering spirits. We're helped by them. He mentions God, who is the judge of all. He mentions the mediator, who is Christ. He mentions the church of the firstborn and he mentions the spirits of men that are now perfect huh when you read over the accounts of men like Abraham when you read the writings of the Apostle Paul when you read the writings of Peter and others it's more than just an exchange of information there is some measure of fellowship that is realized in that I don't have any doubt when we get to glory it's it's not gonna be like we're gonna go up to someone like Peter or Paul and it's gonna be as if we first met them oh it's not gonna be like that there's a fellowship now that is realized when you rehearse Hebrews 11 and when you go back into those old scriptures that speak about Abraham and what he did we just had fellowship with Abraham on the mount about to sacrifice his son that was real fellowship. And that fellowship encourages us on. You see, these people have gone home. If they hadn't made it, there'd be no point to glory in it. They've made it home. And a lot of them had a lot less than we did, but they made it. And they're encouraging you. You can make it too. You read them with this in mind, oh, it'll be a cheering section, I'm telling you. They want you to be there just as much as you want to get there and probably more because they've begun to see more of it. <laughs> so, anyway, we've been raised up into these heavenly places. Now, one last thing and we're done. He tells us why. All right? I've shown you a number of, a number of kind of viewpoints of His mercy and of His love. I hope you've been able to see some of these things. Think of the depth of His love when we were sinners and where He's brought us. Now He's made us alive and then He's seated us in heavenly places. But you know God's purpose, it unfolds and unfolds and unfolds eternally. 
He tells us this is the reason that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, this purpose has a large scope to it. The love of God and his mercy will continue to extend into the ages that are yet to come. And it's going to be good years, brethren. It's going to be a time in which he shows forth his kindness. Now, some of what's involved in the kindness that he will display at that time. I'm going to give you a few of these things, and then we'll wrap it up. The Bible tells us that God is going to wipe all tears from off all faces. All right? And when God wipes them, they're gone. That's going to happen. He's going to wipe them off. It's mentioned in Isaiah. It's also mentioned in the book of Revelation. He's going to, he is going to wipe them off, the Bible says. How about that for kindness? You're going to obtain joy that cannot be taken from you. Jesus had to tell his disciples the night he was betrayed, now you sorrow, and the world rejoices. But he said, you'll see me. You'll see me. And you'll have joy that no man shall ever take from you again. Amen. Isaiah mentioned it this way. He said, you're going to obtain gladness and joy. Right now, joy can kind of slip from you. With troubles and trials, it can slip from you. But I'm telling you, when Jesus shows up, trials are going away. That's God's kindness Amen. toward us. That's His kindness. The rebuke that is upon His people is going to be removed. He tells us through the prophet Zephaniah, it's going to happen. He's going to take us to the place where we were put to shame, and He's going to reverse it. He's going to do this. It's remarkable. Think of this. He's going to do this. This is how you can trust a God like this. You can trust Him, because He's just. He's just. How about this? The Bible says that your name will be confessed before the Father and before His angels. It's going to happen. He's going to do it. If you're not ashamed of Him there, He'll confess your name when He comes again. Boy, I love to think about it. I mean, even today we have high dignitaries that they might say the name of people and just perk up. Because they're honorable. They're, they're honorable people. I mean, think about Jesus confessing your name before angels and before the Father. Well, this is, this is His kindness. You're going to obtain a full knowledge of the truth. Right now we see in part, we see things through the glass darkly, but then we're going to know even as we are known. How about that for kindness? One of the great ailments of God's people is an inability to get as much truth as they want to get. And then to be able to say it with the clarity which they want to say it, right? Not going to happen in that day. You'll be like angels who don't seem to have any problem with the revelations of God. Just come down to Daniel, tell it. It's a matter of fact, but one day you're going to be like that. There's not going to be an area of knowledge where you have no familiarity. Not at all. You're going to be able to probe through it. Amen. Because you'll know all. That, that's what I'm saying. Can you, can you see these things? Amen. These are remarkable. This is part of his kindness. You'll be holy like Jesus. When we see him, we'll be like him. But the biggest thing of all is you're going to see the one whom you loved. Amen. That's the biggest thing to me. Amen. I'll tell you. Amen. I think of a word that Job said, the man without the Bible. I like that. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. I'm going to see him. I'm not just going to have to listen to what Paul has said about him. I'm going to see him for myself. Amen. Well, that's going to resolve a lot of troubles. Aren't you looking forward to that time? Amen. You know what Peter calls that? An abundant entrance. Amen. That's just the beginning. Yes. But it is to me a small sample of ages that will come and come and come in which a multitude of God's mercy and kindness will be expressed through His Son to us in those ages that are yet to come. Well, I think there's one thing I could give you, and we'll close with this, by way of exhortation. Do not let these things slip. 